Thank you, Nisi, for reading scripture. And good morning to all of you in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, we were reminded that this is the last Sunday. This is the last day of the year. We are now looking forward to this new year. And uh, I was just looking at, uh, you know, I uh, browse some videos and uh, uh, I didn't realize, but every year when it comes around, every new year that comes along, there are so-called prophets who become very active and they want to predict what's going to happen next, right? And they uh, have a string of predictions. Uh, some of them go to 40, 50 predictions. <laughs> I was quite surprised. And most of them are so-called Christian leaders. And uh, most of the predictions never occur, of course. And they keep doing it. And some do it so that uh, they will also say, I put it in a book which you can buy. So um, trying to make a little extra bucks uh, through the so-called prophecy. And all of them will say, God told me to tell you. Right? God spoke to me and I am bringing this warning. Uh, and so each year comes by and uh, I was... I had so, uh, such a huge list of predictions, I said, no, there's no point reading it. Um, uh, and, uh, but one, one, one uh, <laughs> prediction that was done last year, I think it was, as 2023 came by, one pastor said, uh, uh, we are going to have a major financial crisis in this coming year, but God told me, you can overcome that financial crisis. How? Bring your tithes to the church. <laughs> In other words, fill up my pockets and then you know, you'll be okay. So this is the kind of uh, deception that goes along. Uh, and so as we uh, come to another year, I'm sure the so-called prophets are very active. They are all trying to predict what's going to happen next. Um, and not that, you know, we know that certain things will happen and must happen. But be careful that we don't fall prey to some of these false prophets, as the Bible says. You know, we remember in Deuteronomy or somewhere it says that if a prophet comes saying that this is the word of the Lord and it doesn't come true, what are they? They are false prophets. And so be careful on that. In that respect, uh, as we move into this uh, new year, uh, beginning tomorrow, new calendar year, even though we have started the new Christian year with the Advent. Uh, let's pray for our leaders. And I would specifically ask that we pray for our Christian leaders, leadership in our own church. Uh, we want to move forward with you know, certainly God's blessings and uh, certainly God's um, guidance and protection, the wisdom that we prayed, for, uh, that we sang, so that we can live lives in a very challenging world. Uh, we know the world is becoming more and more uh, sort of militant in so many ways, and so, so much is happening that can be very challenging for all of us. Uh, as individuals, as families, and especially as Christians. Now, many of you know 2024 is the big election for this nation. What kind of a leadership are we going to get? I really don't know. I, I dread to you know, even fathom what's going to happen if uh, majoritarianism becomes more and more uh, pronounced in our, in our land. And uh, unfortunately, that's going to be quite a challenge. And so, But nevertheless, we know God is with us. And he will guide us, he will help us. Let us move forward in faith. Let's pray for our own leaders here in India, GCI leaders, um, the national ministry team. I was just looking at you know, things that I need to put in place for 2024, now that I, my role is slightly different from what it was. Uh, how will I provide leadership for the Asian region, for our 60 plus congregations? Uh, I have to make sure that, you know, I am available and uh, providing the guidance, of course, through the help of the Home Office. Uh, and all of us need to plan well. Uh, we need to put certain things in place. And it's not just a to-do list, but 
strategic planning so that all that we do is contributing to what we have come to call healthy church, a church that is healthy in every way. Uh, so, um, so think about those uh, items and let's put them into prayer in your personal prayers uh, because church for us is a very important aspect of our lives and you will see it more and more as we speak, as I bring the message today. Um, and I've titled my, uh, my uh, sermon today, uh, Created for Relationship, but I would like to qualify that and say maybe a better version of it would be Created for Communion. For some reason, I like the word communion better than relationship because uh, for us who are disciples of Jesus, who have come to the faith, uh, for us, communion is a much, much more intimate, solid, strong message, uh, much more than relationship, even though relationship is the undergirding for it all. Well, as uh, Pearl reminded us, uh, uh, we have come to this last day of the year, last Sunday, and we probably one, many of us will say, well, one more year has gone by. And some of us might say, where has it gone? Right? Things seem to be whizzing past, right? It just seemed like just yesterday there was uh, a new year being celebrated and suddenly another one has just popped up all of a sudden. I could say personally, 66 years have gone by. <laughs> I've given away my age, so... Um, uh, but you know, as we see these years going by, as we see the new years coming and going, new years coming and going, we can't help but wonder, uh, what is the purpose for all these years that God has given to us? What is the purpose for life? Uh, what are we here for? What are we spending time on this earth for? Um, you know, and deep inside, if you all um, uh, reminisce, if you all meditate, um, we want life to be, well, certainly quality, you know, good in its quality. We want to live good lives, but we also would like it to be, a, you know, a prolonged life, a long life, and that's what we all pray for. When birthdays come by, we thank God for another year, and we hope that there will be many more happy returns, right? That is what, uh, how we try to even wish people. We don't want it to just be three score and ten, if you remember Psalm 90. It seemed to indicate the span of life, Psalm 90. But we would like it to go on, and, and of course we want it to be uh, good. We all wish for a reasonably long life, even though nobody wants to suffer in old age. But we want it to be a reasonably long life. But I come back to that question I asked, why? Why? What is its purpose? What is it that we are living here for? If you ask, if you ask atheists, those who don't believe that there is any reason or purpose for life, they will all say, well, you just live as long as you live and that's it. It's all over. Katham. You know, katham, kalas. If you have a Tamilian background, you'll say, I pochada. You know? <laughs> it's all over. Life is over, you know. <laughs> But those who believe in religion and who are religious and who have believed in a transcendent God, they will say, well, there is a life after death, right? But what kind of a life? What, you know, what, what, what are we looking forward to if there is life after death? Well, they'll see there's a judgment. And in that judgment, you will either move towards bliss, so-called bliss, or the huge uh, debate that's going on. Hell, you know, they talk about hell, uh, and we don't know what they're talking about, but you know, there are so many versions of hell, even Christians uh, can't come to fully uh, under, I mean to say, conclude. Uh, is it annihilationism? That's one version of hell. Is it eternal conscious torment? That's another version of hell. Is it ultimate reconciliation, which is another version of karma, right? Many, 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 many births. And somehow you will sort of merge into the eternal and then of course everything, you don't even have consciousness. So anyway, all these are what religious people believe and they think, well, that is the purpose for life. Well, as was read for us in the, um, 
in the scripture reading. What we do know, Christmas has come and gone by, right? We just celebrated Christmas. But I'd like to visit, revisit that Christmas story one more time <laughs> as we move into the, into the new year. What does the Christmas story tell us with regards to the purpose of life, right? So if uh, uh, Praveen or Roshan can just put back that scripture that we read, uh, maybe you can leave it on the screen because uh, I'll be referring to that. Just a short study on this particular passage in Galatians 4. Um, uh, I'll just pick up some thoughts from there. But notice it says, it begins by saying, But when the set time had fully come, Right there you, will, you, must, be, uh, you must be prompted to recognize that God works along with time. When the set time had fully come, there was a particular time when it was needed for something to happen. Now, that doesn't mean to say God is a slave of time. He created time. But even though He created time, He honors its demands. He honors its sequence. He is respectful of the time that He created and He wants things to be done on time. Right? So th here is the set time that has come. And uh, just the other day I was talking to someone and, uh, and we were discussing all the problems that we see around the world. And uh, the question, you know, many, many Christians have this question. When is it all going to end? When is the second coming? You know, when is the fullness of the kingdom here? Why is it taking so long? It's a question that is echoed even in the scriptures. Where, when, what, you know, we are longing for that time. All I can say is, there is a set time. And according to that set time, it will happen, right? We can be sure, we can be confident that God in the set time will bring everything to completion. We hope it is sooner than later, but we know that God honors that time. He has not given us the privilege of knowing it, but we live in faith, just like all the, the, the five wise virgins were ready whenever it should happen. Like the carol team that came to my house. They knocked on the door at midnight, and I said, well, I'll be ready. <laughs> and so I said, remained awake. And so there is a set time when things will happen. And maybe when it happens, we might be saying, like what we are saying today, where did the time go? <laughs> Suddenly everything, is, you know, everything has happened. Uh, or maybe not. Maybe we will be completely, our time will be redeemed for us. And we don't have to wonder about, you know, passing of time. So we will be in a new dimension of time, perhaps, at that time. So, um, but I just want us to notice that when the set time had fully come, God will bring it about. We, we, like I said, not privileged to know it, but God will work it out. And all I can offer to those who say is, when is it going to happen? All I can say is, God will do it in his own time. Let's just have faith. And then it goes on to say, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. The incarnation. Christmas, right? That is Christmas in its short, sweet uh, phrase, right? Uh, God sent his son. That shows the divinity, the divinity aspect, the divinity dimension of uh, this reality of this phrase, God sent his son. Obviously he came from heaven, referring to his divinity. But how did he send his son? Not in a, you know, Airbus uh, 347 or on a drone. He was sent born of a woman, right? Perhaps indicating, referring to his humanity. 
divinity, humanity. Born of a woman, right? Fully divine, fully human. That's uh, the very powerful, very important Christian doctrine. So this is Christmas, right? Born of a woman. It includes there, interestingly enough, born under the law. Born under the law. Why? Why did he, was he born under the law? Well, Matthew chapter 5 tells us why. And in Matthew 5, I don't remember the verse, maybe it is 17 or 18, where he says, I have not come to abolish them, that is the law and the prophets, I have come to fulfill them. So why was he born under the law? So that he could fulfill them. And here is uh, something which is uh, so wonderful for us to know. Because he came born as a human being, for being fully divine under the law, he could fulfill them. None of us are able to fulfill them. And that is why the Apostle Paul, picking up on this, and once again, I'm just going to read verses, uh, which is not on the screen. Uh, in Romans 6, he says, For you are no longer, uh, you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Because Jesus was born under the law, he could fulfill it, we have been, we have entered into the uh, age of grace. We have now uh, come into the grace of God, right? But it goes on to say in verse 5, to redeem those under the law, right? To redeem those under the law. Redeem from what? Death, right? Death. We are all dying. Why? Because sin entered the world through Adam and death passed on all human beings, unfortunately. The entry of sin brought death. And Jesus came to reverse that order, that process. He brought life through his own life he brought life and that is why it says uh, again the apostle uh, Paul writing to the Corinthians in chapter 3 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 6 he says the old written covenant ends in death but under the new covenant the spirit gives life and that is the wonderful story of Christmas. But it doesn't stop there. It doesn't end there. Now notice something very interesting. Now that the Son of God has come, He has, He was born under the law to fulfill it, and now has redeemed us from, the, from death which passed on all human beings. For what reason? For what purpose? That we might receive adoption to sonship. Sonship. You know, daughtership. <laughs> sonship is an all, you know, uh, comprehensive word, to in, is inclusive to include all humanity. Right? Uh, notice the Bible is now telling us, or the Christmas story is now telling us the very purpose for our existence, our creation. As we ask that question, why are we living all these years on this earth? And we can go back and say, why did God even create humanity? Here is why we are given a glimpse that we might receive adoption to sonship. Sonship presupposes Parentship, if you can say it, right? Or fathership, mothership. Uh, what is it, uh, what is the underlying factor there? A relationship. 
God is showing us that he's establishing a relationship. Right? There is, there is no son if there is no father. Right? Uh, son establishes the existence of a father or a mother. Or both. <laughs> right? It's the existence of a relationship. Uh, so the purpose, you could say, of creation simply is a powerful relationship. What kind? To help us understand, these are the words that are being used. Sonship, father, shows intimacy. It shows that God is interested in the highest intimate relationship with humanity. There was no, you know, cutting corners there. God wants us to have the most intimate relationship with him. So the Christmas story is telling us that there is a purpose for our existence. And what is that purpose? Well, simply put, it is for relationship, a very intimate relationship. Because that is why fam the whole uh, metaphor of family is used, father, son, and all of that. But I would like to say communion. Because Jesus was born as a human so that he can take his, our humanity into his so that we might have communion. Notice the intimacy there. Jesus was not just interested in coming as a king or a master even though he is a king and he is the master, but he comes as a son of the father, making us his brothers and sisters. Notice the intimacy with which God wants that relationship to be consummated. Right? It's communion. That's why I like the word communion a little bit more better than the word relationship. Right? Yes, it is a relationship, but it is the highest form of relationship known to human understanding. And that is one of uh, a familial relationship. So the ultimate purpose of creation, of our very existence, is to actualize, to realize the full potential of creation. That relational reality to help us, to usher us into the very fundamental reality of life. I think all of you know that the ultimate reality of, of consciousness, of, of everything, is relational. Even science confirms that. As much as I can understand, not that I am a scientist, uh, but Science seem to be beginning to realize, you know, science is always trying to find the, what's that called, the ultimate particle? Uh, it used to be called Higgs boson or something like that, right? They're trying to find what is that particle that gave rise to everything that you see around us. They are going, they are going back to the very fundamental reality of, of some particle that existed where life came to be. Right? That is, science seemed to be, have, have understood that. Even science now beginning to see that ultimate reality is not um, uh, some one particle. As some philosophy, some philosophical thought says, non-duality. There has to be one simple particle, right? Um, the ultimate reality is not, is not nothingness. I mean, we all say that God created from nothing, right? And that's true. But something had to be there for the creation to exist. And science knows and, and has proved that there has to be uh, a beginning. But what is the most fundamental uh, reality? I was just reading a, uh, an article by John Horgan, uh, where the title of this particular article is, Is there a thing 
or relationship between things at the bottom of things. <laughs> right? He's trying to once again understand did everything start by a thing? Or, interestingly enough, he says, was there a relational aspect between things? And he goes on to say, quantum mechanics, and once again, I, I, I confess, I have no knowledge of what this is. Uh, you know, these are all high fluted words. You may refer to our, the scientist of GCI, and that is uh, Franklin Poppins, and he will probably tell you a little bit more about <laughs> quantum mechanics, but all I can do is read the, what the experts say. He says, quantum mechanics inspires us to speculate that interactions between entities, not entities in themselves, are fundamental to reality. Right? Entities, yes, but it is the relational dynamic between entities. In other words, relational dynamic is the fundamental reality, not the thing. Let me bamboozle you with a few more scientific quotes, right? Good for us to exercise our minds a little bit before the new year, right? Here go, here's another one. Wheeler, Wheeler is another scientist, He's, he suggests that we live in a participatory universe. <laughs> Those words should be very familiar for us in GCI. Participation, participatory. In other words, something, the most fundamental aspect is participatory and not just something individual, you know, things. Carlo Rovelli, a, prof, a professor of physics, says reality is not a collection of things, it's a network of processes. It's not a collection of things, but a network. Once again, establishing the relational reality. Another uh, author says, for most of human history, humans have lived and learned in small communities where relationships were our natural habitat. Relationships is natural. It is not something we drummed up and we created or we engineered. No. Relationships is a natural aspect of life. And to quote our great Rabindranath Tagore, uh, in his, one of his poems, he said, Relationship is the fundamental truth of this world of appearance. Of course, uh, he might have more philosophical thought on that, but notice it. Relationship is the fundamental truth of this world of appearance. All of these people are trying to say, science is trying to prove that there is some kind, a rea there, there is a reality that is relational. And brothers and sisters of GCI, what can we conclude? What is our conclusion? What is the most fundamental reality of of consciousness. Any thoughts? What is relational? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Science is proving <laughs> that it's a relational reality that existed as fundamental reality of this universe. It's not a thing, it's not one, it's not non-dual, it is a relationship. And we know from the scriptures, the Bible confirms God is the fundamental reality and he is triune. The Bible, even the Old Testament, and I'm surprised how much of the Old Testament, as I have been doing a little study on that, how much of the Old Testament is indicative of a Trinitarian reality. I'm shocked that so much of it, in fact, even the Jewish rabbis could not but write with a certainty, or rather copy the Bible without messing with that understanding. The fundamental aspect of God being triune. And we know God is the fundamental relationship. Uh, God is communion, right? 
uh, one God, three persons, three hypostases, as it says uh, theologically. And that is the reason why God is love. There is, love exists only in a relationship. God didn't become love after creating human beings. I hope you know that. The, how do we prove that? Jesus himself prays. You loved me before the creation of the world. Love existed before the creation. And so God is love because he is a relationship. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Hence our purpose. What's our purpose? To enter into that relational reality. What are we created for? We are created for communion. The scripture confirms, notice verse 6. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out Abba, Father. Notice the triune nature of that verse. What do you find? God, spirit, father. Right? I mean son. There is a triuneness. You cannot escape that reality of God. So our ultimate purpose is to be children of the Father in the Son through the Holy Spirit. That is our great purpose. And in verse 7 it goes on to say, So you are no longer a slave but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Right? Notice that. You are not a slave. You are not a slave. Why would he say that? Right? Verse 7. So you are no longer a slave. Why would he say that? I mean, I, to me, it's, uh, I can't help but be curious. Why would he say that you are not a slave? Because God fathomed the most intimate relationship with us. He doesn't want us to be slaves. He doesn't want us to be the big boss. Big Boss is a television series, I think, where they fight, right? That's what I, all I know is that. He doesn't want to be the big boss. He wants a affinity. He wants, a, he wants to touch us. Right? And that is why he, we have the incarnation. He touches us in the incarnation. He touches our humanity. We are children. He, he brings in that most intimate relational reality known to us and because we are children we become heirs now this is something interesting right we become heirs heirs are those who are inherited they inherit something right um, some of you are some of us may be wondering what is this son father relationship by it becomes boring after a while you know, give me something more tangible. Will I get a salary, you know, when I'm <laughs> in heaven? Will I have, be able to have some fun? Will I be able to eat some good food, <laughs> a good drink? I mean, uh, we want something a little bit more tangible. What is this relationship, you know? I mean, uh, it seems a little uh, kind of... Uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, not very worldly, you know. I mean, we want something more worldly. But here is something which is so interesting. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, and maybe God, God is helping us to understand, hey, there is something along that comes being a child. What? You are going to be made an heir. And so you must be asking me, heir, oh, that means I'm going to inherit something, right? What am I going to inherit? One acre of land in the heart of the city? What am I going to inherit? Could, you know, I want something tangible. Will I be able to have some paisa, some food, some fun, you know? And there I put my hands up. I'm sorry, I can't say what it is. But I can say what the scripture says. Notice in 1 Corinthians 2 how it describes this inheritance. However it is written, what no eye has seen, <laughs> what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, 
the things God has prepared for those who love him. In other words, our inheritance is beyond our imagination today. It is so great, it will be so wonderful, so beautiful, we can't describe it in words. We just can't describe it in words. Let's see what Peter says about our inheritance. What does Peter say? In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, According to his great mercy, notice how he is relating to human beings, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope, that's the purpose of life, so that we are born as his children, living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, for what? For what reason? To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Is it one acre of land, three acres of land? I don't know, but it is something I can say is beyond human imagination. That's how great the Lord Almighty has blessed us with. You remember the prodigal son? Uh, the second son, we all uh, gravitate towards the first son, but the second son is equally important. When, the, when he came and complained, eh, what, this Hotla fellow, you know, you came and gave, gave him a big party and all that. Wow, what about me? I've been serving you so much. You, know. you remember what the father said? Right? Of course, he talked about the son again. Uh, you know, this fellow is alive. You know, we need to celebrate. But then you remember what he said? My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. Wow. The father is promising or saying, our inheritance is everything that the father has. How generous can this father be? I mean, once again, I, I can't fathom it. I can't, give, I can't put it in words. I can't tell you exactly what all this means. But all I can say is this father is so generous. Everything I have is yours. We will be able to enjoy the bliss and the joy of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's all I can say. And it's indescribable. There's a song, right? I remember Jessica singing it once. A song, you know, unimaginable or something like that. Right? Indescribable, yeah, there you are, indescribable. Okay, let's conclude now. I can see my time has gone by. Conclusion of the matter. You remember who said about the conclusion of the matter? Solomon in Ecclesiastes, right? Yeah. It's interesting to just look at Solomon. What did Solomon say? He said, I want to have fun, man. I just want to have fun. My purpose for creation is have the most fun. And so what did he try? He tried everything under the sun. There was nothing that he denied himself. He said, I am going. To. That's why I was created. Because I got desires. I got this. I, got, I need to enjoy it. And he never denied himself food and drink and wives and porcupines. And you know, <laughs> I keep saying 700 porcupines. No. Um, what did he conclude after all that? Huh? No, but before that, after enjoying all of this, huh? Or an, an, another way of putting it, meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. <laughs> all the goods and properties and all that stuff he could amass and enjoy brought him to the point of being suicidal. Do you know Solomon was suicidal? He hated life, it says in the book of Ecclesiastes. He became suicidal. He said, if this is life, I don't want to live. I don't want to live. But thankfully, being the wisest man, there was another conclusion he came to and that's what you were referring to. What was that conclusion? Yeah. 
Here's the whole story, he says. Here now is my final conclusion. What does he say? Fear God and obey his commands, for this is everyone's duty. Interesting, isn't it? If you sit and analyze that. Another translation puts it like this. Fear God, or rather, yeah, fear God, do what he tells you, and that's it. That's it. What he's saying is, fear God. He came to understand a relationship with God is more important than all the things he can line up one after another. 10 cars, 15 cars, you know, 55 bungalows, all this stuff. No, that is not what really brought meaning to life. His meaning in life was a relationship with God. When it says fear, the word fear is not the way we understand it. It's a respect, it's an awe, it's a trust, it's a faith, it's a participation with God. So, brethren, as we turn another corner to another year, a new year, may we remain inspired by the wonderful future God created us for. Life is in communion with God, which gives us the foundation for communion with one another. If we don't have that communion with God, being in Christ, we will find it difficult to have communion with one another, because that is the foundation. So, uh, New Year, why don't we be more relational this coming year? That is what we are called for. That is the fundamental reality of life. Be more relational. Now some of us are, you know, introverts and what's the other one? Extroverts, right? Extroverts te tend to be a little bit more relational, supposedly, but that don't be fooled. Introverts can also be very, very relational. Their, relation, their relationship is probably a little bit more intense than, you know, uh, extroverts, but all of us have the ability to have relationship. Why don't we be more relational? Right, this coming year. Visit a family, invite a family, have a meal, talk to somebody you haven't. Right? Be more, let's be more relational. Now that, that, but don't quote me now and don't say, uh, you call up some family and say, I'm coming for dinner today. Pastor Garu said, you know, you can, I, I am supposed to relate with you. <laughs> Don't uh, put me on the spot. But be more relational. I mean, think of ways you can be more relational. Improve your relational quotient. Did you know RQ? IQ? EQ? RQ? What is IQ? Intelligence quotient. EQ? Emotional quotient. RQ? Relational quotient. Don't forget there are RQ. Let's improve our RQ this year, this coming year. Dedicate yourselves to know more about God. You can't do without God, you know. Because God is the master of relationships. He is the author of relationships. It's only in Him we can understand what relationships is all about. Attend church. That's relational. Attend Bible studies. That's relational. Right? Special services. That's relational. Participate in activities. That's relational. Let's do it with a sense of passion. You know, with a sense of purpose. And as we immerse ourselves into God's relational reality, we can improve our RQ more and more and more. That RQ becomes more meaningful. Even though we might not get the kind of response, but our RQ increases, improves. And that is what God has invested in us. And as you do that, you glorify God. And in God's glory is your happiness, your joy, your peace, and your hope. And so, brethren, the ultimate purpose for life is that we are created for communion. Communion with God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and communion with one another. Shall we just pray as, we, as I end? Gracious Lord, thank you, Father, for this... Uh, wonderful revelation that we would never have known unless it was through Christ our Lord who became the living word and gave us the written word. We thank you, Father, for helping us understand why we were born, created, why we are in families, why we are 
in a church, in a community of believers. Help us, Lord, as we looked ahead that indeed we will be more intentional and uh, understanding of what our cue is and that we would improve that uh, through the foundation that you have set in us in Jesus Christ our Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you.